Bukele first came into power in 2019, and for nearly two years, he's overseen a vast and brutal crackdown on gangs. Human rights groups are dismayed, as are relatives, as more than 65,000 people have been arrested over the past year. Across the country, more than 70,000 people have already been taken into custody, proudly trumpeting a huge decline in the country's murder rate. March 25th, 2022. 87 people were murdered in El Salvador in retaliation for the government's seizure of two bus routes in the capital, which gangs extorted for revenue. The perpetrators were members of MS-13, that ruthless criminal group we all know operating out of this country and across its borders for decades. But amidst their formidable reign, Salvadoran President Nayib Bukele and his government obliterated this gang and its nefarious network with just one move. One move that had changed the course of this nation's history forever. Inception February 1980, Archbishop of El Salvador, Oscar Romero, wrote an open letter to then U.S. President Jimmy Carter, pleading with him to halt military aid to the Salvadoran regime. Romero expressed in this letter that the U.S. was supplying aid to the very people who were taking over El Salvador and oppressing its people. At the time, the Spaniards were in control of El Salvador's resources while ruling Salvadorans with an iron fist. Romero sought peace for his people, but tragically he paid with his life, as he was was assassinated just three weeks later. And even though the peace Archbishop Romero desired was finally achieved by Salvadorans nearly 40 years later, under President Nayib Bukele and his ruthless anti-violence policies, more on that later. Those four decades to redemption were filled with their own struggles, conflicts, and ultimately deaths. March 31st, 1980, 250,000 Salvadorans gathered for Archbishop Romero's funeral. But during the service, government-sponsored snipers attacked the crowd, killing 42 people and wounding over 200. It was a complete massacre, and although some men involved were apprehended, these Salvadorans had no idea that the worst was yet to come. December 2nd, 1980, four female American missionaries were kidnapped by five Salvadoran National Guards. They were driven to an isolated location where they were beaten, raped, and murdered by these guards. Their bodies were found the next morning, sparking outrage by both local and international bodies. U.S. President Jimmy Carter responded by temporarily cutting off aid to El Salvador, making way for a group of civilians to rise and form their own paramilitary group, called the Farobundo Martin National Liberation Front, aka the FMLN. These guys fought fire with fire, retaliating every attack orchestrated by Salvadoran military groups. When the FMLN was finally on the verge of taking back its country, a dramatic shift occurred with the election of new U.S. President Ronald Reagan. The Reagan administration reallied with the Salvadoran Armed Forces, increasing their financial aid to them for $10 million, with $5 million going towards rifles, ammunition, grenades, and helicopters. And while other world leaders were perplexed by this move, a few others had joined in. The military government in Chile provided substantial training and tactical advice to the Salvadoran Foreign armed forces, while the Argentine military dictatorship also supported the SAF as part of their Operation Charlie. Now listen closely, because what I'm going to say next brings everything we've talked about so far together. 1989. The FMLN's attacks on the Salvadoran Armed Forces demonstrated that the conflict was at a stalemate. Neither side seemed capable of attaining a strategic advantage. At the same time, world events were stripping away the foreign support that had sustained both parties. The collapse of the Soviet Union signaled the loss of crucial allies for the FMLN. On the other hand, the end of the Cold War shifted U.S. policy in that region as well. There was no longer a compelling interest for the U.S. to support the unsavory Salvadoran during counterinsurgency. This reality, along with the aftershock of the countless murders, prompted the U.S. to push for a peace settlement. Now, while all this was going on, approximately 80,000 soldiers and civilians in El Salvador had been killed as a result of this war. Nearly half of the country's population had fled to the U.S., settling mostly in L.A. and around California. And although the Salvadoran War was finally brought to an end, the violence in the country continued. 
Many individuals who had relocated to LA as refugees during the war became involved in gang violence. During this, the US war on drugs and anti-immigration policies had been popularized. This resulted in the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996, which called for the deportation of immigrants, documented or undocumented, with criminal records at the end of their jail sentences. Now, the big shock to this story is the fact that these gang members weren't experienced killers or some kind of angry mob. They were actually young Salvadoran teenagers. Now, during the war, several families got displaced, forcing hundreds and hundreds of victims to navigate their path all alone at an early age. Some of the reasons these youths would join these gangs now were because of the sheer feeling of neglect and abandonment from family, as well as normalization of violence in society. So with these gangs, they had found a sense of security, a sense of hope, maybe a sense of belonging. All this would only cost their free will, as it now belonged to those gangs, notably the 18th and MS-13. These two gangs are quite similar, but their rivalry tells a different story. The 18th Street Gang, also known as Mata 18 or simply 18, is one of the largest transnational criminal gangs in LA, with around 30 to 50,000 members between the US, Mexico, and Central America. They're also allied with the Mexican Mafia, another US-based syndicate. And according to the FBI, some factions of the 18th Street Gang have developed a high level of sophistication and organization in carrying out their dealings. Members of 18th Street frequently identify themselves with their outfits bearing the number 18 or frequently sporting teams like the Duke Blue Devils or the LA Clippers, among others. In Guatemala City, many bus drivers have been killed by 18th Street members for driving through their territory. The bus drivers were often victims of robbery or extortion. In one particular case, a driver refused to pay the gang. Consequently, his son was brutally killed a few moments later. So, where the violence level of 18th Street ends, that of MS-13 begins. Although they may be rivals, MS-13 is significantly ahead when compared side by side. Also known as Mata Salvatruca, 13. MS-13 members are direct descendants of the FMLN squad that fought in the Salvadoran War. Typically, they're impoverished young men and teenagers, often homeless and estranged from their families, who would survive by engaging in minor drug dealings, theft, and extortion of street vendors, along with some other small-time crimes. From a statistical point of view, El Salvador has the third highest femicide rate in the world. In 2016, one in 5,000 Salvadoran women were killed, and only 5% of femicide cases resulted in convictions. I mean, if you do the math, I'm sure you can tell that's a pretty low figure. Many Mata Salvatruja members cover themselves in tattoos, including their face. Some would ink the words MS, Salvatruja, the Devil Horns, and the name of their clique from head to toe. However, in the early 2000s, the gang was moving away from face tats, making it kinda easier to commit crimes without being noticed. Members of MS, like many American gangs, would utilize hand signs for purposes of ID or communication. One of the most commonly displayed is the Devil's Head, which forms an M when displayed upside down. And if you happen to be into heavy metal, this might also look familiar. But here's the part that might actually interest you. Their level of cruelty has resulted in some members being recruited by the Sinaloa cartel, battling against Los Zetas in the Mexican drug war. Their wide-ranging activities have drawn the attention of the FBI and U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, who have jointly initiated wide-scale raids against known and suspected gang members, arresting hundreds across the U.S. But did any of that stop them? Well, no. Instead, it only made him stronger. In 2004, the FBI established the MS-13 National Gang Task Force to enhance collaboration amongst local and state law enforcement agencies aiming to dismantle MS-13. Their primary strategy would involve them deporting gang members to their home countries rather than incarcerating them in the U.S. When that approach proved ineffective, the FBI initiated partnerships with law enforcement in El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, and Mexico, establishing their own offices in these regions to confront the gang at its source. Now, the strategy yielded significant success, resulting in a series of arrests and crackdowns across the U.S. and Central America, involving over 6,000 police officers across five countries. In the U.S., 73 suspects were apprehended, while more than 650 MS-13 gang members were taken into custody. Yet it just seemed the more they were arrested, the more violent they became. Until one man came along, Nayib Bukele. Crackdown. 
These images released by El Salvador's government shows the transfer of about 2,000 inmates and with their heads shaved to what's been dubbed the country's new mega prison. President Bukele's strategy to put an end to this gang violence was built upon pre-existing strategies by other Salvadoran presidents, most notably Antonio Saca. In June 2004, President Saca implemented a policy, Super Mano Dura, which granted the Salvadoran military the power to conduct patrol of gang-controlled areas and execute random searches of suspected gang members, along with the ability to arrest individuals on appearance alone. As a result of this policy, around 4,000 gang members were arrested, leading to overcrowding in El Salvador's prisons. And by 2012, these gangs sought for a truce. In March 2012, the MS-13 and 18th gangs established a truce in collaboration with the Salvadoran government. Now, this truce received criticism because it seemed as if the government was fortifying sovereignty to these gangs. But even if that was the case, it had a positive impact. In early 2012, there were an average of 16 killings per day in El Salvador. But in late March, that number dropped to fewer than five per day. And on April 14, 2012, for the first time in over three years, there were no killings in the country. Overall, there were about 411 recorded killings in the month of January 2012, but in March, the number was only 188. That's like a 50% reduction, showing that this truce was actually effective. But sooner than later, it fell apart and violence plagued the streets again. By 2015, there were some 60,000 gang members in El Salvador, and 70% of the country's businesses were being extorted, leading to annual losses of $4 billion, according to estimates by the Salvadoran Central Reserve Bank. The homicide rate was at its peak, even higher than it had been during the Civil War. If you take the time and do your homework, you can find out that violence originated from 18th century Salvadoran struggle over land ownership, and then it escalated into political violence involving left and right-wing parties, and eventually it gave rise to the MS-13 and 18th Street gangs, who were in a racial hierarchy war in the U.S. with African-American gangs. But how exactly did Bukele manage to halt this century-old cycle of violence? Well, to understand that, we need to first understand who Nayib Bukele is and the violence that impacted his youth. Born on July 24, 1981, Nayib Bukele grew up in San Salvador as a privileged outsider. His father was a Muslim businessman of Palestinian descent who opened the country's first McDonald's franchise, ran a textile company, helped build four mosques, and even owned a PR firm. He was also a polygamist with six wives. Now, Bukele, who had three brothers and seven half-siblings, went to a bilingual private school. However, his political apprenticeship began after he dropped out of college and was managing a nightclub in downtown San Salvador. He ended up taking over his family's PR firm, whose key client was the FMLN. And yeah, that's the same FMLN that engaged in the Salvadoran War against the country's armed forces. The presidency and the assembly, however, were controlled by the Alianza Republicana Nacionalista, or ARENA, which was founded in the early 80s by a member of a right-wing death squad. The party catered primarily to the business elite, but its members included ex-military men and religious conservatives. In 2009, an accumulation of corruption scandals sank the arena, allowing the FMLM to gain power, which it held onto for the next decade. Being that it had been in business with him, Bukele, through a couple of connections, launched a self-funded bid to become the mayor of Nuevo Cuscatlan, a municipality in El Salvador. He won the election, and due to the huge impact he created, the FMLN encouraged him to run for mayor of San Salvador, which he did. By this time, the FMLN were trying to soil his political future with their shady past, at which point Bukele was forced to cut him off and start a new party. The party that led him to becoming the president. June 1st, 2019. Nayib Bukele was elected as the 43rd president of El Salvador. He became the youngest head of state in Latin America and embodied a new national beginning. His first step to eradicating these gangs was to negotiate a peace treaty, as reported by local newspaper El Fado. But here's the thing, less than a week after the story was published, Bukele announced that the government would investigate El Fado for money laundering. I mean, right? It sounds weird, but ever since then he's attacked the newspaper relentlessly, sometimes calling out journalists by name. A few of them were even forced into exile, 
Many others have adopted the practice of just leaving the country after publishing a story and waiting to return until the threats have died down. The newspaper has a large international following, but inside El Salvador, Bukele's campaign against it has succeeded. Many people have come to see El Fado as partisan and unreliable. On top of that, the Salvadoran National Assembly passed a questionable law to block news outlets from reporting on gang situations. Journalists could face up to 10 years if they try to reproduce or transmit information that might have come from gang sources or could otherwise panic the public. Why did Bukele make these laws, you ask? Well, it all boils down to the bigger plans he had to stop the gang violence. March 2022. MS-13 had slaughtered 87 people in three days. We know the country has a history of violence, but this? Nah. Now, this was pretty unusual in its ruthlessness. People with no ties to crime were targeted. A fruit seller, a surf instructor, a homemaker, a cobbler, anybody. These gangsters went after everybody, but their message was directed at one person. Nayib Bukele, who had promised to radically reduce crime and change El Salvador's image abroad. These gang members left corpses and human remains on the road, leading to Surf City, a beachfront real estate on the Pacific coast, which Bukele had refurbished and renamed to attract international tourists. The story of this bloody massacre made headlines worldwide, and it brought out Bukele's dark side. He began his infamous crackdown by declaring a state of emergency in the country. He would create new policies allowing rival gang populations to mix up in prison, a practice that was never implemented in a bid to reduce prison violence. But authorities arranged hundreds of bare-chested prisoners in their underwear, pressed them tightly together in rows, and took pics of them to send a warning to other gang members out there. Bukele would use extreme legal measures, covered in the face of democracy by enacting new policies that really deprive Salvadorans' basic constitutional rights, such as the right to legal defense and freedom of movement, while simultaneously relaxing rules on making arrests and authorizing the state to intercept civilian communications. Includes that arrests can be made without a warrant and detainees no longer have a right to a lawyer. Private communications of all citizens can also be accessed by the government. Under these draconian laws, security forces have launched a swift and aggressive assault on gangs, apprehending members and suspected associates without warrants or solid evidence, significantly speeding up the process compared to previous crackdowns by other presidents. To put into context just how effective this crackdown was, El Salvador recorded 33,000 arrests in the first few months. This is in addition to the fact that the state of emergency emergency has suspended constitutional rights to legal defense, allowing authorities to detain individuals indefinitely on vague charges without the necessity of an arrest warrant or supporting evidence. Detainees are also denied the right to a court hearing within 72 hours of arrest, and lawyers, even civil society organizations, report being unable to communicate with those detained. Arrests are now often based on unverified intelligence, rumors, and info sourced from unusual places like social media profiles. Additionally, the Bukele administration has enacted new laws aiming at keeping gang members incarcerated for longer periods. Jail sentences have been heightened for gang affiliation, and the option of house arrest for individuals associated with these gangs is no longer an option. The initiative might be impressive, but how effective was this crackdown? Well, according to multiple sources online, Areas and neighborhoods in El Salvador that were plagued by these gangs for decades are now free from their strongholds. Few residents reported seeing remnants of the gangs in their neighborhoods, while some mentioned the return of active gang members who were released from jail. But they say these gangsters held far less power than before the state of emergency. Also before the state of emergency, gang members extorted people working for small and medium-sized businesses, including street vendors, shop owners, bus operators, and taxi drivers in communities under their control. But now, all all that's in the past. An owner of a bus company who previously paid around $6,000 in monthly extortion fees to two main gang factions said he stopped paying immediately after the crackdown began. The Salvadoran police also reported a 54% reduction in extortion complaints between the start of 2022 until September 2022. But ironically, this method, while deeply concerning, has proven to be the most effective crackdown in El Salvador's history. The only question left to answer right now is, can this Bukele type of crackdown be enacted by other countries plagued by gang violence around the world? Changes everything.
February 2023, Nayib Bukele ordered the transfer of 2,000 people accused of gang membership to a recently opened mega prison in the country. This mega prison has the capacity to hold a staggering 40,000 inmates. The complex is located about 74 kilometers southeast of the capital, San Salvador, and is made up of eight buildings, each with 32 cells that hold more than 100 people apiece. The disturbing detail here is that each cell has only two sinks and one toilet. The prison wardens hide up in ski masks to avoid becoming targets if these members actually do get out. And speaking of getting out, many critics believe subjecting these prisoners to such a level of cruelty would have an impact on El Salvador's economy once they got out. But according to Bukele, they won't ever be getting out. The crackdown Mr. Bukele has led on organized crime has locked up roughly 75,000 people, meaning at least 1 in 45 adults are in prison. Now other leaders in the neighborhood are taking notice, and have debated adopting many of the same drastic measures to fight their own criminal violence. But even if they wanted to make the same trade-off that Bukele's government did, making the streets safer with methods that are blatantly at odds with democracy, they aren't likely to succeed. The conditions that enabled Mr. Bukele's success in political stardom are unique to El Salvador and can't be exported. Why, you ask? Well, let me break it down for you a bit. The United States, the European Union, and the Organization of American States have criticized Bukele's acts as president. This guy's accused of threatening members of Congress with troops and firing Supreme Court magistrates while replacing them with judges who have allowed Bukele to run and win for a second term, despite a constitutional ban. The foreign criticism has also enabled Bukele to unify Salvadorans against a common enemy and has put him and his country of six and a half million people on the map. Conversely, this small nation is now run as a police state. Soldiers and officers whisk citizens off the streets and into prisons indefinitely without providing a reason or allowing them access access to a lawyer. There are credible reports that inmates have been tortured and, in some gruesome cases, killed. In 2022, Madam President of the neighboring country Honduras, Ms. Jamara Castro, declared a war against extortion, following in Bukele's footsteps. Now, in her case, the homicide rates may have decreased, but gangs still remain powerful. If you go further south, Ecuador is reeling in from its own explosion of gang violence. Some citizens say they want a man like Bukele to wipe out the violence and come to set things right. And even in Chile, historically both a stronger democracy and a safer country than El Salvador, citizens claim to want a man like Bukele. But Bukele copycats and those who believe his model can be replicated in other Latin American countries overlook one key point. The conditions that allowed Bukele to wipe out El Salvador's gangs are some that are only special to El Salvador. You see, their gangs were unique and far from the most formidable criminal organizations in the entire region. For decades, just a few gangs fought themselves for control of specific territories. And when you put that in comparison to the powerful cartels in Mexico, Colombia, and Brazil, you begin to realize that El Salvador's gangs weren't big players in the drug trade and were more focused on extortion. Compared to these other groups, they were poorly financed and not as heavily armed. Another thing to make a note of here is that once Mr. Bukele arrested the major leaders, the gangs just crumbled. I try to put that into another syndicate around Latin America, where criminal organizations are wealthier, more internationally connected, and much better armed than El Salvador's gangs once were. Take the cartels in Mexico, for example. The Mexican war on drugs, though didn't involve strict legal policies like that of Bukele, resulted in the arrest of hundreds of cartel drug lords. Yet because these cartels were so coordinated and well-structured, almost nothing changed. Instead, they just fought back. And in some cases, new criminal groups quickly filled in the void, drawn in by the drug trade's huge profits. If you go to Colombia, Escobar's war on the state in the 80s and 90s tells a similar story. No matter how hard the Colombian government hit this organization, his backlash was stronger. El Salvador also had more formidable and professional security forces, committed to crushing these gangs when Bukele called on them, compared to some of its neighbors. Consider Honduras, where gang-sponsored corruption among security forces apparently runs deep. 
This circumstance helped doom President Castro's attempts to emulate like what Bukele did from the start. If we go back to Mexico, criminal groups have reportedly succeeded in co-opting high-ranking members of the military and police. Similarly, in Venezuela, there have been reports of military officials running their own drug trafficking operations. So even if the president sends soldiers and police to do Bukele-style mass roundups, security forces may not be prepared, or just may have incentives to undermine the task at hand. And finally, Bukele faces very little political opposition, considering there aren't really any parties to oppose his government. In many other Latin American countries, there are more robust political parties or opposition forces in place that would help keep an overreaching executive in check. To put it in simpler words, most governments out there have never agreed to enforce the types of policies Bukele enforced. It just isn't that constitutional. And here's something no one actually talks about. While the crackdown's impact in El Salvador was transformative, the gangs aren't finished. In fact, the government's own data contradicts the Bukele administration's narrative that the gangs have been completely defeated. In October 2023, Bukele's administration claimed to have arrested 52,541 members of MS-13, 13,682 members of Barrio 18 Sureños, and 10,750 41 members of the Barrio 18 Revolucionarios, but these figures were overhyped. According to official Salvadoran police records, more than half of these detainees under the state of emergency are not full-fledged gang members. Specifically, there were about 32,331 arrests of gang members, 41,733 arrests of suspected collaborators, and 3,435 of individuals under investigation. While at least 36% of gang members and collaborators, over 42,000 individuals, remain free. So, can the Bukele strategy work for other countries? Well, if other countries try to copy what he did, they're more likely to replicate only the dark side of El Salvador's model, and not its achievements. Governments could find themselves consumed in chaos, as criminal groups multiply in numbers or fight back with ample firepower. In the process, they could potentially shrink the space for civil society, government transparency, and pile a bunch of detainees into already overcrowded prisons. Historically, presidents in Latin America who have been less than fully committed to democracy have been eager to take some or all of these steps for political gain anyway. So maybe crime fighting makes for the perfect excuse. For all its success in lowering crime, the Bukele model comes at a stark cost. So if these leaders and presidents are willing to bear that cost, it might just truly change everything.